Hello, uh, welcome. Oh, thank you. Welcome to uh, our ECR um, seminar. Today we have uh, Nick Rod from CERN. Uh, Nick did his PhD in MIT and uh, was a postdoc in UC Berkeley, uh, recently has moved to CERN. And today he's going to present um, on the topic of new ideas for the Axion Dark Matter program. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's been very nice uh, getting to know some of you over the last 30 minutes and I hope to get the chance to meet you all in person one day. Uh, so today what I want to tell you about is, I guess, review this idea of the Axion Dark Matter program, tell you why I'm so excited about it, and then tell you about something I've been thinking about recently, which is this Axion Dark Matter program is going to happen. In the next 10 to 20 years, we're just going to cover an enormous amount of uncharted parameter space uh, that may well reveal what is the dark matter of our universe. But I've also been thinking about what can we do with these instruments, given that they seem inevitably going to exist now, what other ways can we use them to either improve the search for dark matter or look for new signatures there, and that's going to be this idea of dark matter interferometry I'm showing you on the left, uh, and I'll, I'll explain exactly what's going on in this animation later on. And in particular there, I'll describe some work that came out in a paper last year, done in collaboration with Josh Foster, Yoni Khan, Rachel Wynn, and Ben Safdie. And in the second part of the talk, I'm I'm going to move to a slightly optimistic idea, but one I'm also excited about. And that is the possibility that there could be an analog of the cosmic microwave background made up of these axion particles. Uh, and these actually detectors designed to look for dark matter may in, um, accidentally, or they'd have to look for it, but may end up discovering um, um, the CAB as we've dubbed it. Uh, and then this work will be um, based on a paper from earlier this year done in collaboration with Jeff Draw and Hitoshi Moriyama. Uh, so throughout, of course, I'm coming from this from a, a particle physics background. Uh, so please, if anything I'm, I'm saying is unclear, I mean, either because of that or otherwise, uh, uh, interrupt and ask me. But before diving into either of those topics, what I want to do is just tell you again about, uh, I'll tell you about what this Axion Dark Matter program is, if you haven't, uh, aren't familiar with this, and give you some sense for why I'm so excited about this. So as a particle physicist, the way that you think about uh, particles to begin with is that they, they can be written down in, in um, the form of some sort of Lagrangian interaction. Uh, and the axon comes in in the form of this um, uh, uh, term I have at the top of the slide. It couples to FF tilde, where F is the um, electromagnetic field strength. So this is going to give some modification to electromagnetism. A here is the axion. And then the coupling that determines the strength between the axion and electromagnetism is this GA gamma gamma. Now, one technical aspect of this that will just be uh, important is that this, uh, because all terms in Lagrangian must have dimension four, uh, actually this GA gamma gamma has to be dimension four. So it'll carry some units of um, inverse energy and you'll see this later on. But in practice, I mean, what actually happens when you add this term to the Lagrangian is you get a modification to Maxwell's equations. And this is what I'm showing you here. You see, you get a single correction to Gauss's law and two corrections to the Ampere-Maxwell um, Ampere equation, the one at the bottom. So they come in two characteristic flavors. There are ones that take time derivatives of the axion field, and there are ones that take special gradients of the axion field. Uh, and so it turns out if you're thinking about axion dark matter, because we know dark matter has to be non-relativistic at the location of the Earth, uh, otherwise it wouldn't collapse to form halos, it turns out that these time derivatives which pull out the energy are going to be larger than the spatial derivatives which pull out the momentum, because the momentum will be suppressed by this small non-relativistic velocity. So actually the entire axion dark matter program, as it operates through the, um, the coupling to electromagnetism, is really dictated by this final term in the Ampere-Maxwell law. And actually there's sort of this analogy if you stare at these equations between this, this final term and the, the current that's there in the um, uh, Ampere-Maxwell law. And it tells you that in the presence of a large magnetic field, the axion induces an oscillating effective current. And so this is really how all these instruments, uh, many of these instruments are operating to search for, for dark matter. Now, later on, when I come to the CAB, I'll be talking about a relativistic axion. And then actually these other two terms I'm throwing away at the moment become relevant. There's some interesting physics, you know, that they give additional modifications to Maxwell's laws. And so there's some in interesting aspects there, but I won't talk about that in the talk. We discussed that in our, our paper on the CAB. Okay, so this is the effect we're looking for, some modification to Maxwell's equations and specifically in the presence of a large magnetic field, if there's an axion, that's oscillating through the earth, this is the dark matter, you'll get oscillating effective currents you can search for. So let me tell you, I mean, this is how you'd search for dark matter, but let me tell you about the parameter space for this axion particle. 
you can maybe already get a sense it's pretty enormous, but I'll break down what's going on here. So what I've got on the x-axis here is the mass of the axion in units of electron volts. So just for reference, the proton has a mass of about a billion electron volts. Um, so you can see these are going to extremely small numbers here, 10 to the minus 12, up to very high numbers of 10 to the 7, um, which is about, uh, 10 MeV. On the y-axis, I'm showing you the coupling strength between um, uh, electromagnetism and the axion, and it has units, as I mentioned earlier, it's dimension four. And this has um, values going, um, generically, they're just very small. Uh, and the intuition for why they have to be small is if they were bigger, we would have seen it already. Okay, so let me tell you about what we actually know in the space at the moment. Now, it turns out there are a set of bounds you can set on this axion, even if it isn't dark matter. And these are the so-called star emission bounds. And the intuition here is that if the, there is this particle that exists in the universe, then it, if it couples to electromagnetism, it could be emitted from stars. And then there are two ways of setting constraints on this scenario. Either this gives a new cooling mechanism for stars because these axions would be emitted and then escape the star, so they carry energy away. And of course, we understand stars well enough that you can't just add in large amounts of arbitrary cooling mechanisms. Uh, there are constraints on this. Alternatively, though, this axion could be emitted from, say, the sun. And then if you build a large magnetic field, you can actually convert the axion back into a photon. Um, and this is what is done at the CAST experiment, which operates at CERN. And they, again, set limits on just an axion existing at all. It doesn't have to be dark matter. On the other hand, if the dark matter is very, uh, if the axion is very heavy, um, then something um, uh, it can undergo with this coupling is it could decay to two photons. And then if these photons are, say, in the, um, uh, the X-ray range, we could just look for photon lines. We're very good at doing that with X-ray instruments. And we can set limits on anomalous, um, uh, 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 the excess production of such lines. And these are the limits we have up here. But here, this requires the axion to be dark matter. It's not just arbitrary. So you can notice that this really cuts down to very, very small values of the coupling because we're very good at, uh, at these searches. You can see there's a little island there at about 10 to the four EV, which I've highlighted in blue. Um, this is an exceptionally biased coloring. It's because I uh, am actually, a, this is actually a result of my work here. Uh, and the reason, like what we were actually doing here is we weren't thinking about axions. We were just generically searching for dark matter decaying to X-rays, sort of motivated by this anomaly I mentioned earlier, the three and a half KV line. Uh, but any constraint on uh, dark matter decay to photons uh, it can be reinterpreted as an, uh, a constraint on axions. And so this is what this parameter space down here is. So technically in this paper, we use the um, XMM Newton telescope to, to set these constraints. So this sort of lays the land, but you can see to the bottom left, there is an enormous amount of white space. And so what's useful is to think about, well, is there any theory prediction on um, where we should look in this white space? Or do we really just have to try and cover all of it, which would be very challenging? And the answer is that there is a theory prediction. And this comes in the following sense. As I mentioned um, at the start, or for, for those of you who weren't there, another big problem we have in particle physics is the so-called strong CP problem, or, or why doesn't the, um, the neutron have a, a measurable uh, electric dipole moment? Uh, and it turns out the axion can give a solution to this, uh, but through an argument I won't go through in detail here, it turns out if you do solve the strong CP problem, then the axion, there's actually a prediction for what the coupling strength is as a function of the mass in some sort of minimal uh, scenario in the UV. And this tells you that you want to live somewhere along this orange band I'm showing you in the middle. So this is a challenging target to reach, but a target nonetheless. And so this is one that the, uh, the sort of the dark axion dark matter community has coalesced around and said, well, let's try and get our um, sensitivities down to this line. So where are we at at the moment? Uh, and something I should have mentioned earlier, actually, um, what I'm, I'm largely showing in these slides is sort of an incomplete you know, summary of what the field of axion physics is. If you want a more complete summary, have a look at this GitHub page at the bottom um, right. I'm showing. This is actually a repository put together uh, by Kieran O'Hare, and it's just a fantastic resource for these sorts of searches. So please have a look. So just back to the main theme here. So what are we actually at at the moment? So what we're, we're doing is we're using these instruments called axion haloscopes. And so that these are instruments that are looking for the um, dark matter halo of, our, uh, of the Milky Way being made up of axions. And what they're doing generally is looking for this oscillating effective current that I mentioned earlier on. And so there's various types of instruments. There's resonant cavity instrument that looks to resonantly convert into photons. And I believe in exactly one of these types of instruments is, is as was discussed, is operating in Korea at the moment. Um, and I think actually they're at your institute. Uh, but some of the, the limits we have at the moment, you can see in the center here. So for around this micro EV range, we're already 
be cutting into the KSVZ and DSFZ, which are specific UV models, predictions for the, uh, the, um, the axion that would solve the strong CP problem. Uh, you can see we haven't covered a huge amount of the parameter space yet, but we're just getting into this, and so far we haven't seen a definitive signal. You can also see at lower masses, there are these instruments, uh, which are haloscopes, but are not yet cutting below the, um, the star emission bounds. Uh, so they're making more assumptions, but they're not even getting as far. So you might say, why am I showing you these? Well, again, because I'm involved in one of them. Uh, but the, I mean, more to the point, uh, what's actually going on with these measurements here is that these are proof of principle instruments showing that this type of detector technology can operate. They're quite different to these resonant cavity instruments. And at the moment, they're, they're small prototypes, essentially. And the idea here is that in the coming decade or two, much larger versions of these instruments they have a very good volume scaling, will significantly improve the sensitivity. And indeed, the ambitious goal of this dark matter radio program, which is what, what Abracadabra uh, will merge into, is to cover the entire space I'm showing you here. And, and for details, there was a snow mass letter of interest about this. And so you can see this will um, cover an enormous swath of the, um, uh, the QCD or the, the, the strong CP solving uh, axion prediction. Uh, and just give you a flavor for where in the next 10 to 20 years we're going to be. And this is very incomplete. There are ideas across this mass range for um, how we can get down to the QCD line. And, and what you should really think is that if this is what the dark matter of our universe is, we could have the answer in the next um, 10 to 20 years. So it's sort of this you know, exciting progress I expect that, that we'll have, which is really the inspiration for the talk today. And this is to think about two new ideas to take advantage of this enormous experimental progress we're going to have. The first of these is to really take seriously this idea that dark matter is behaving like a wave uh, in this regime, and then to uh, perform an, an operation we often do on waves, which is interferometry, where we essentially combine measurements made at spatially um, uh, distinct locations. And I'll show you, you can get new information out of using this idea of dark matter interferometry. And then secondly, I'll think about the possibility that we actually could see something that these instruments were not at all designed to detect, and that is a genuine analogue of the cosmic microwave background made up of these axion particles. So let me now dive into this first topic of dark matter interferometry, which was based on this paper I mentioned earlier on. Right, so as I said, this idea of dark matter interferometry is going to take very seriously the idea that in these very light mass ranges, the dark matter would behave like a wave. So here, what I'm showing you, uh, obviously, is an image of the Earth, but what I have on top of that is a, a very optimistic sized um, abracadabra instrument, which is one of these dark matter detectors I mentioned earlier. And so the idea is, is what this is looking for is some oscillating wave of dark matter passing through the Earth. And then this gives a, a modification to electromagnetism that they're searching for. So what is the frequency of these oscillations? Well, dominantly, it's going to be set by, um, of course, the oscillations are set by the energy, but then dominantly, this is dictated by the mass because this is a non-relativistic particle. So at first order, you can think about this axion as just a, a cosine uh, oscillating in time um, uh, at a frequency given by the mass of the particle. Of course, what makes this, this problem really hard is we don't know what that mass is. Um, so you have to, to have some clever search strategy to cover an enormous range of frequencies uh, in looking for this. More accurately though, if this is really a wave, it will have a more complex phase structure, um, which is the fact that the, the time dependence will be controlled by the full energy, not just the mass. And then of course, spatially, um, uh, it will vary according to the wave vector, which for a non-relativistic particle is the, uh, uh, the momentum. So let me just break down these components briefly. So as I said, you know, dominantly the energy which controls the time uh, dependence of the, this wave will be uh, dictated by the mass. But there will be corrections to this. And this means that if you actually were able to resolve this signal, you wouldn't just see a delta function in frequency at the mass. You would see a distribution uh, associated with the fact that there is this famous correction uh, to the energy, which is a half mv squared. Uh, and so this is going to, the fact that the axon has a finite velocity will give you a distribution in frequency space that you can actually look for. Uh, and this is what these dark matter instruments would expect to see in the frequency domain example is what I'm showing on the bottom left. One thing to note though, which I mean is admittedly quite trivial, but will be quite relevant for what I'm talking about here, is note that if you're just measuring the time dependence, you can map out this full structure and learn about the magnitude uh, of the velocity of the dark matter, but you're actually insensitive to the direction. And this is just because V squared, um, you lose the directional information. 
Uh, so actually, if you're just making measurements of the, the, the energy of the axion field, you have no idea whether the axion is hitting your detector from above, below, left, or right. This information is just lost. Where this information is retained, however, is if you were somehow able to measure this k dot x contribution, uh, because this is genuinely the momentum for a non-relativistic particle, which carries the information of the, uh, uh, the velocity or the direction. However, this uh, k dot x is essentially invisible to a single detector. Um, uh, I mean, you can think about various ways you could hope to measure it. You could uh, pull out a, a special gradient uh, um, uh, to get a, a contribution from the K and the amplitude. But as I mentioned earlier, because this is suppressed by V, this is very hard to search for. It's down by three orders of magnitude from, uh, if you just look at the time derivatives. Alternatively, you might think, well, maybe we can do something at the level of the phase. However, if you think about this for a moment, you can convince yourself this is impossible uh, because this all depends upon um, the, the position of your detector, this, this X. Uh, but I can always choose the origin of my coordinate systems however I want. And if I choose the origin to be the location of my um, uh, detector, this X is zero. And, and so you can convince yourself more generally that there's no physical effect associated with the phase for a single detector here. However, from what I've said here, I've, I've said the word single several times, maybe it then becomes clear, if we do want to get access to you know, basic properties like which direction is the dark matter hitting our instrument, uh, one way we could do this is to use two detectors. Because if we use two detectors, then there is a, 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 um, a length scale that we can't just remove by some clever choice of coordinates, and that is the physical separation between the two instruments. And actually, as I'll show you now, by doing this, we can get information about which direction the dark matter is coming, which again is just invisible to a single detector. Okay, so what we did in our paper is we, we calculated, okay, let's say you have two instruments, or actually we, we consider the case of N instruments uh, that are all making measurements of, of the axion field through um, uh, its, its modifications to electromagnetism. How would you construct a likelihood where you could essentially do optimal parameter uh, estimation uh, by just combining all that data set? So I, I'm, I'm being ambitious in the talk and trying to cover two topics. So I'm not going to go down the path of explaining how all that operates. Instead, what I want to do is just give you one of the outputs of that formalism, tell you what the physical ideas are that are actually driving the equation here and show you how really you can understand the basic ideas of interferometry is coming um, um, out of that. So if you recall earlier, the, the signal shape you see if you're just making time domain measurements uh, is controlled by the speed distribution. That's what sets the finite width of the axion signal. What we find in our likelihood formalism is that this is modified to this calligraphic F, which is given by this integral expression I have at the top of the slide. So you can see this depends genuinely on the full um, velocity distribution, that's this F of V, which contains information about which direction the dark matter is coming. But then it's modulated by this cosine factor. And this cosine I've written as MAV dot X12, but MAV is just K. So what this cosine contains is this K dot X term that we saw in the axion, but then the X that appears is the physical one, is the separation between the two instruments as I've, I've defined below the earth on the right. So let me just check some basic sanity aspects of this, this um, uh, formula here. If I put the two detectors on top of each other, I, I, I can't get any benefit from interferometry. It requires spatial separation. And indeed you can check if X12 goes to zero, cosine goes to one. And then thanks to this delta function uh, at the end, this entire integral collapses back to the speed distribution. So no, no additional information is contained. On the other hand, if I put these detectors infinitely far apart, well then essentially they're just gonna sample a random phase of the axion field and on average you won't get more information. And indeed you can check that because this cosine will oscillate violently, on average this, this term will go to zero if you send X12 to infinity. So that sort of separates the boundary and at either end of the boundary, you get no additional information. So of course the, you then hope that there's some sweet spot in between where things will work. And what dictates physically that the spatial scale where things operate is the, the length scale over which the wave you're analyzing varies. And this is the coherence length of the field. Uh, and so this is given by one over the mass times uh, the velocity dispersion uh, of the field. Um, and you can, okay, so this is mathematically where this, this expression is gonna be maximized, but then you can ask practically, okay, if the coherence length is from um, you know here to Alpha Centauri it's not particularly practical for me to build two instruments there so you need to calculate what that is and it turns out that actually in a lot of the, the uh, mass range that people are thinking carefully about for axions uh, it's quite plausible so 25 micro EV where there's instruments like a uh, haystack uh, the coherence length is about 10 meters so you could potentially have two instruments in the same laboratory to perform this this measurement uh, whereas at much lighter masses, like a nano EV, the coherence length is now several hundred kilometers, but you could imagine a network of uh, uh, experiments, either, for example, on say the continental 
numerous or more ambitiously around the world is what I would uh, hope uh, that could perform exactly this type of uh, interferometry. And what I'm showing you in the inset figure on the right here is essentially how the signal varies as a function of the difference. And you can see these two limits uh, in purple, uh, we're, we're heading to the limit where we just go back to the normal speed distribution, which is in black dash as the distance becomes small. In blue, you can see that as the distance become large, it's oscillating in between, but it's in this orange uh, curve that, that there's some um, uh, optimal information to extract. So everything seems like it, um, you know, we're, we're coming together. There's some sweet spot in between. But now let me tell you about a real problem that, that, that there is with this um, uh, approach, and it's a fundamental one. And that is that there is actually an inherent degeneracy if you really want to know which direction the dark matter is coming in at. You really want to know what this V is. And that is because we only have this dot product entering this expression here, this x12. And this tells me that if I have my detector vector, um, uh, like say in this image here on the right from the uh, uh, pointing in the, the north south direction, say I have one detector at the south pole, one detector at the north pole, um, uh, any rotation of the incident dark matter velocity around that vector leaves this dot product unchanged and therefore I couldn't possibly distinguish it because there's not going to be any uh, modification to my likelihood uh, as I, I make that rotation. Um, so for example, if I, the true um, uh, incident direction of the dark matter is the center of this image I have here, uh, I wouldn't in, um, actually be able to know whether it came um, from there or equivalently anywhere along the equator. So you can see sort of this, this heat map is showing you where I think um, with my instruments the dark matter is coming from. Now this is still an improvement from one detector where you, you couldn't tell me on the sky where it's coming from, it could be coming from anywhere. But it's a little bit unsatisfying that, that we can't really um, pin down exactly what direction this is coming from. Uh, but again, this isn't just you know, a limitation of the way we've set this up, this is really fundamental. This dot product goes back to the phase that enters the axion field, it's a real fundamental obstruction. However, nature breaks this obstruction for us, which is very satisfying. And that is because um, the Earth, the surface of the Earth is not in the rest frame of the dark matter of the Milky Way halo. Uh, in particular, the Earth famously undergoes these daily uh, modulation effects as it, it rotates. And so if we have our two detectors located on the surface of the Earth, actually this X12 vector is continuously changing in the, in the reference frame of the dark matter. And this means that while for any individual X12 there is a degeneracy, over the course of a day, uh, it will be lifted. Sort of another, I mean, uh, effect associated with this, which is one that, you know, it would be very satisfying to see if we ever make a discovery of the axion, is that because of this, if you actually took the information from two detectors and combined them, the signal shape you would see would change throughout the day because of this change in X12. And so, for example, for a realistic setup, what I'm showing you in the image here is that you can see that the signal shape you're changing can vary dramatically. And actually this, you know, it's not impossible that we could hope to resolve this. Um, uh, in any signal as it, it started to emerge. And you can see that the, the, you know, the changes to the signal aren't small, they're order one variations to the, the, the shape of the signal. And this is because, I mean, this interferometry is a large effect. Uh, we're, we're looking at the scale over which the amplitude of, of the dark matter wave varies by an order one amount. So if this is changing, then the combination will undergo order one changes as well. Uh, so this is really a unique form of, of daily modulation that you would expect for wave-like dark matter um, that you can see with this idea of interferometry. More to the point though, you know, can we actually uh, do what I sort of hinted at at the start we would really want to do with this type of formalism, and that is determine which direction the dark matter is coming in. And so what I'm showing you in these heat maps here is again, I have um, uh, put the true location of the dark matter at the center of the map. And then in a more realistic setup than I showed you earlier, I've asked, um, can I actually infer what that direction is? And the heat map, the, the brighter that is, tells me how likely that is. Uh, actually, there's sort of, you know, formal notion in terms of sensitivity and test statistic that I have um, uh, defined underneath um, um, these plots, which I can explain if there's interest, but you just think about this as how likely this, this um, we think this should be. So what I'm showing you in the two heat maps here are two different detector configurations. One of them, I've placed the two detectors um, uh, on an equal line of uh, latitude. So they're exactly east-west of each other. And on the right, I've put them on an equal line of longitude. So they're exactly north-south of each other. And what you can see is that in the north-south case, we've correctly identified the, right, the center of the map. Whereas in the east-west configuration, there seems to be a, a second uh, maxima um, up to the, the northeast of the center of the map. And you might ask, are they, are they equivalent maxima? And actually, they're, they're exactly. There is an exact degeneracy uh, still here if you place your um, uh, experiments in the east-west configuration. And you can understand this, uh, and that is because 
if you have these two detectors in the, in, uh, on an equal line of latitude, throughout 24 hours, this X12 vector does not map out the full three-dimensional space. It actually only maps out a plane. You can think about as this rotates around um, with the Earth. And this means that if I take the velocity and then invert it across that plane, nothing changes. Again, I'm completely insensitive to that inversion. And you can check that this is exactly where this residual degeneracy is coming from. So this would be unfortunate, but we know about this ahead of time. And so if you're, if you're setting up this configuration, just do not put your detectors exactly east, um, west of each other, otherwise you'll, you'll have this. I mean, also a third detector would break this degeneracy unless you also put that on the exact same line of latitude. Um, but uh, in general, it's just something that you, you can know ahead of time and avoid. Okay, now move to a more realistic case, sort of, these were, I mean, slightly realistic, but a bit cartoonish depictions of what we could do over the past few slides. So if I go to one of these real experiments that is looking for dark matter, let's say it makes the discovery of dark matter next year. Well, then you can ask the question of, okay, once it's found dark matter, how well could it determine which direction on the sky the dark matter wave is coming from with two detectors and just one day of data? And the answer is it could determine the, the location on the celestial sphere within one degree accuracy, just with one day of data. And, and sort of the, the reason why you can do so well so quickly is as I showed you earlier, this interferometry effect is an order one change to the signal shape you're seeing. So as soon as you start to see um, uh, any sort of uh, axion wave emerging, you can very quickly start to see these oscillations that interferometry induces and use that with our likelihood formulas to infer exactly which direction that the, the case is coming from. So here we um, actually generated some Monte Carlo data for what Haystack would see, used our parameter inference, and you can see um, the true location is what is in blue, and it gives you some um, um, sense for how well we were able to infer that direction. Okay, so finally, um, uh, just to show you these, these animations I had at the start of the talk, so one other question you can ask is, what if the dark matter, instead of just being in some ambient halo, was potentially in some ultra coherent stream, a, a lot of it near the location of the Earth? Now, I think this isn't what we would first expect, but it's some possibility we might want to explore. Well, you can also answer the question of where um, uh, the stream is coming from. Uh, and so again, what I'm showing you here is for two set setups of this east, west and north, south, but instead of for just some bulk dark matter halo, which is what we expect, we've got some sort of uh, uh, more optimistic or uh, a scenario where the, the dark matter is coming in some ultra coherent stream. Now, again, the true location is the center of the map. And what I'm showing you here is how well we could infer where the, the dark matter is coming from before the Earth rotates. So let's say we just take 15 minutes of data. So the Earth hasn't appreciably rotated. This is what you would get. And you can see there is these um, uh, rings or rotational degeneracies associated with this rotation around the X12 axis. And you can see the X12 axis points east west on the left and north south on the right. But what I'm going to do now is let the Earth rotate and add, uh, I think it's every 30 minutes, I'll add additional data. And you'll see slowly we'll be able to break the degeneracy. As we start adding in the information, we eventually isolate the, the, the center of the, the map as the correct location. But again, because this is east-west, you can see that there's again another point that is incorrectly identified uh, because of this residual degeneracy. If we do the north-south configuration, however, after one day of data, you can see we correctly identified just a unique position at the center of the map. Now, there's, there's more structure going on here. You can see all these multiple um, uh, local maxima all over. There's a much more complicated um, um, pattern here. I claim that you can get all of this from this integral expression I showed you earlier, but in the interest of time, and I think I was a bit ambitious in what I wanted to talk about today, I might skip over this, but if there's questions later, I'd be very happy to come back. Okay, so that was all I wanted to say about um, this dark matter interferometry idea. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions about this part if there is now, but in the interest of time, I can also jump into the next section and, and take questions about this at the end. But I'll pause for a moment in case there are questions. It's about 30 minutes. Excellent. Okay, so um, let me now jump into the second part of the talk. And this is no longer thinking about using these instruments to search for dark matter or how we could do new things with that. Instead, I want to look for a signal that they were not designed to search for. And this is this idea of a cosmic axion background. And really, the only question I want to answer for, your, for you today is, is it at all plausible that these instruments could see some analog of the cosmic microwave background made up of axions? And, and as I'll try and show you, I mean, we have to be somewhat optimistic, but this is how I try and be, uh, then the answer is yes. 
So what I'm going to do is gen sort of at the start of the talk, I gave you this Axion dark matter landscape picture. What I want to tell you about now is sort of a CAB landscape picture. And if um, uh, I suspect that there will be people in the audience who, who know about this, there is this, this large program now of searching for, for example, stochastic gravitational waves. Uh, often um, the, the landscape of um, how that is described is going to be quite analogous to what I'm doing with the cosmic axion background here. So again, let me orient you on what I'm showing you on the axis here. On the x-axis, instead of showing you the dark matter mass, because I'm imagining this as relativistic, the mass is no longer an important quantity. Instead, I'm showing you what is the, dark, the, the axion energy or frequency equivalently, if you think about this as a wave. And the frequency range I'm showing you this over um, is overlapping with the range of frequencies that instruments are looking for dark matter. So there's this instrument dark matter radio I mentioned, uh, there are these resonant cavity instruments, and then there's also at high masses instruments like Mad Max. There are many, many other instruments. This is just a, a very small subset of these that I'm mentioning here. So that's what's on the x-axis, the, the axion frequency or, or energy. What I'm showing you on the y-axis is what is the energy density at that frequency? And, and the exact definition is here, it's, it's determined in terms of the, the critical density. And again, just to say there is an analogous plot regularly made in the context of, of gravitational waves where you have some signal um, coming up from the bottom with low, um, low energy densities. And then we have some instruments like um, LIGO and LISA that cut into this at various frequency locations. Good, so let me now give you some sense for what um, uh, what parameter values you know might be plausible here so if you had an energy density in the cosmic axion background equal to the cosmic microwave background you would live at um, uh, this this gray line here now i don't need to tell this audience but uh, the, the absolute reality is that if you had the energy density in axions equal to the energy density in photons we would not be living in the universe we are um, there would be extremely large modifications to delta n effective. And so this scenario was excluded. So you have to live somewhere below this, this gray dashed line if you want to be talking about a, um, a, a genuine cosmic relic. However, if you live a little bit below this line and you're optimistic, the possibility could be that this CAB could give some observable modification to cosmology uh, and then also maybe be detectable in the ways I'm talking about now. Now, uh, the, please take with a, a very large grain of salt this purple band I've set here. This is this H naught preferred that I really should have put the inverted commas on this. Um, but of course, as um, has been well discussed in the literature, uh, there is this, this Hubble tension and one very mild way of alleviating this, it does not solve it in my view at all, is to add some extra radiation or delta N effective. And, and you can see here, if you actually look, what happens when you, you add some uh, delta N effective is you change the early values of the Hubble constant or equivalently, you know, you can interpret this as an age of the universe, but you move the central values apart, you just blow up the error bars. Uh, so this is not a resolution, but it does mildly alleviate the tension. But I think more what you should think about this purple band is, is, you know, eventually this tension will be resolved. Um, and what then will happen is that if there is actually some radiation down at these levels, then in, in particular, for example, CMB stage four, we might expect to detect this. They, they very are optimistic about determining very small values of delta N effective. And if we de definitively detect a, you know, a non-zero delta N effective, well, one possibility of that could be this cosmic axion background. I think then would really motivate the type of searches I'm describing today. So let me now put in realistic candidates for what the, the, the CAB could be. And I won't go into too much detail about this um, because I think the specifics for what I'm talking about today are not super important. But of course, if, if you want to know more, just interrupt and ask me. Uh, so that the first case is a, a direct analog of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, this is some axion that was in thermal equilibrium with the other standard model particles in the early universe. At some point, because we know it doesn't interact very strongly, it, it decoupled. Uh, and then that, that radiation bath of axions that was produced then just redshifted until today. And actually, I mean, because the, the physics is very similar, uh, the CAB is going to look very similar to what the CMB looks like. You're just going to have a black body distribution picked it around a microwave, which is about um, 10 to the minus 3 EV. Now, exactly the, how much energy density is in this and where the peak is determined it is um, uh, determined by when it decoupled. Because if it decoupled earlier, well, then there were other um, uh, modes that went non-relativistic that dumped their entropy into the, the, uh, the photons, which uh, at that time the axon wasn't coupled to this, so it wouldn't have uh, uh, benefited from that. Uh, but the picture is that you would generically expect some energy density around here. This is the, I think, in some sense, the most interesting idea of the CAB, but as we'll see, it's the hardest to probe. Uh, so it's also worth thinking about, well, how else could have we produced um, axion radiation in the early universe? 
And the answer is, I think there's going to be many ways of doing it. In our paper, we discussed a couple, and just to mention these here, um, there's a large discussion ongoing in the literature at the moment uh, that actually one of the things we think happens in the early universe with these, or we know should happen in the early universe in many of these axion scenarios, is that when the symmetry the axions associated with is broken, you actually get these topological objects known as cosmic strings that are produced. And these cosmic strings will radiate axions. And this is for reasons I'm not going into here is a very important question for the dark matter axion uh, story. But actually, these strings could also um, uh, radiate relativistic axions that will produce axion energy density over a very large range of frequencies. This is what I'm showing you in the inset plot on the bottom right. But the picture could be that we could easily have a, an energy density um, uh, in this plot I'm showing you here produced by these strings, for example. Secondly, there are more exotic production mechanisms. There is this scenario that is, is, has really been described in the theory of reheating known as parametric resonance, uh, where essentially if you have some scalar field that couples to the axion that during inflation gets perturbed from its minimum, then eventually when it begins to oscillate, it can dump a huge amount of energy into the, these axions and produce uh, essentially what is thought to be a Gaussian spectrum of these axions uh, over a wide range of energy uh, and potentially, again, if we're optimistic, uh, in the um, energy densities that would enter into this plot here. Okay, so again, I didn't go into a ton of details here, but I expect that there are going to be many ways that you could generate um, relativistic axions in the parameter space I'm showing you here. What I really want to do um, is now just tell you briefly about how you could hope to detect these particles. Uh, and again, the question that, that is relevant is, are these relativistic axions going to be behaving like um, a, a coherent wave because there's many of them overlapping, or are they going to be best thought of as individual particles flying around? And the, the way to answer this question is to calculate how many particles per, you know, essentially um, volume determined by the wavelength of, 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 of these states, which is the de Broglie volume, um, do you expect? And if you, you calculate this, you find that uh, to the left of this dotted line I, I've introduced on the right hand side of the figure, you have more than one, whereas to the right, you have less than one. And so for the lower end of this plot I'm showing you here, you absolutely can think of the CAB as the same classical wave in which terms I describe the dark matter in the first part of the talk. Whereas if you're to the right, you should think about the CAB as individual axions flying around, more like gamma rays than radio waves. So why this is useful is because we can just lift this whole formalism of thinking about classical waves um, to look for, for the CAB. Yeah, and in a bit more detail, you know, again, what we're going to have is each axon is some oscillating cosine, but we have many of them, you know, added on top of each other. This is sort of where this classical wave picture comes from. And so each of them are going to be oscillating at some energy, which is drawn from the energy distribution, which could be quite broad. This is these distributions I showed you on the previous um, plots. Uh, whereas up to that, we would expect them essentially to have a random phase. So if we looked at what this axion signal would look um, a, a appear as in the time domain, if we did this for dark matter, what we would find is that because all of these particles essentially have the same energy, because they're all sitting right near the mass, you end up with an extremely coherent field. And so this is what you can see in the top left, the oscillations of this field are very coherent, they're very regular. However, what you can see is that, um, that the amplitude of this field will vary. And this, this depends upon how the random phases come together. There really is some statistical nature to the, to, to the axion field. Um, uh, however, what is not varying is the fact that it's very regular. If we look at the, um, uh, the, and just to say, I may not have explained that, but that the three different colors are three Monte Carlo realizations of how this field could look, essentially different ways the random phases are combined. However, if I then look to a more re, um, uh, uh, an axion field that is more analogous to the cosmic axion background, one where the energies are drawn from a Gaussian, not this very narrow distribution of dark matter, uh, again, the amplitude will, will, will be dictated by these random phases, but you can see that there is far less regularity. Um, this field is jumping all over the place, which is consistent with the fact that um, uh, we've added together many different uh, frequencies that are quite distinct from each other. So realistically, the best way to analyze these fields is not in the time domain. I mean, these plots are quite complicated, as you can see, on the, especially on the bottom. Uh, really, realistically, what we end up doing is analyzing these in the frequency domain. So you know, one way of looking at these is just looking at these frequency distributions. And if I plot them on equivalent x-axis, if I want to see the dark matter case, you might notice that I've had to multiply the, um, the x-axis on the top right here by a factor of a million. And that is because this distribution is so narrow, I've had to multiply it by a million to see what's going on. However, if I look at the dark, uh, the CAB, sorry, you can see it's very broad. I haven't had to multiply by anything to see the finite width here. So one way of quantifying this width that is convenient is to introduce something that is called a Q factor, uh, which essentially um, uh, yeah, measures um, uh, how wide this distribution is. 
And the larger it is, the, the narrower the distribution is. Essentially, the more regular or, or the longer the coherence time of a field. Uh, so for the uh, dark matter case, we, we know it should be about 10 to the 6 uh, is what the Q factor should be. Whereas for these relativistic cases, generically, we expect it to be order 1. It's, it's quite a wide distribution. So just sort of one comment here. You know, if you are able to see this signal, which I'll now tell you in the next minute or two, you, you should be able to do. Uh, if you're looking for this in the frequency domain, the signal shows up very differently. Dark matter appears as this extremely narrow peak in the frequency domain, whereas the CAB would deposit power over many different uh, in frequency bits, so over a wide range. And I can tell you actually the way the experiments operate at the moment is they would throw out this sort of broad power because that's characteristic of some of their backgrounds. They often just smooth their data and remove the smooth component. So if you are going to search for this, you need to not do that. Um, but in principle, it is very searchable um, for nonetheless. Okay, so now let me just say a little bit about um, uh, how you could actually detect this. I appreciate I'm saying to run out of time, so I'll, I won't go into all the details here. But what I'm actually going to do here is just calculate for you how much power is in the axion field, because you know ultimately what we're looking for in these cavities is some power in electromagnetic fields that was induced by the modification to Maxwell's equations given by the axion. So you can just sit down and calculate what the average power is. Uh, it's determined by what the energy density is in the field. This is what rho A is. And then it also, of course, as a function of frequency, depends upon where this field has power as a function of frequency. And this is this P of omega I'm introducing, the, the, the PDF or probability distribution of, of the powers, uh, of the frequencies, sorry. Uh, now, technically, we can't just measure the axion field directly. Uh, this problem would be a lot easier if we could. Of course, um, uh, famously, as I showed you earlier on, all the couplings that enter um, Maxwell's equations come in with a derivative. This is technically because this axion is a pseudo Goldstone boson, but at the end of the day, you just have to keep this derivative factor um, uh, there. And then also, of course, there's some tiny coupling between the, the things we can see, electromagnetic fields, and the, the dark matter we can't see. And this is this GA gamma gamma. And so this will also suppress our power. Uh, then to make my life a little bit simpler, um, rather than just consider all possible uh, cases of P of omega, if I want to do a, an estimate here, I, I can estimate what form this probability distribution takes on in the following sense. If I evaluate it at the mean value, it'll take on a value that is about this Q factor I introduced divided by the mean frequency. Now, why is this? Well, remember the Q factor was a measure for how narrow the distribution was. So if I have a narrower distribution, it has support over a smaller range of frequencies. In order for the PDF to remain normalized, it has to have a much larger uh, amplitude. So the, the, the narrower it is, the larger the value. And so the value of the PDF is essentially uh, amplified by, by this Q. This is why this has appeared here. And then dimensionally, it has to have units of one over frequency and, and, and the, the natural value is the, the mean frequency I've put in here. This is a rough estimate, but it, it will get, get us the parametric scaling uh, of what I'm gonna show in a moment. Okay, so now the way I want to estimate power to the CAB, and again, I'll finish up in a moment, uh, is to calculate how much power would dark matter deposit in these instruments, because we know what that is. This is, you know, these plots I showed you earlier on, they're really looking for anomalous power. And this is how they're able to set sensitivities, for example, on the dark matter. And then I say, if the CAB deposits an equal amount of power uh, as the dark matter, then I'll call it detectable. So then all I want to do is um, equate this expression I have in the bottom left uh, for the two cases, uh, the, the, dark, uh, the dark matter and the CAB. If I do that, I, I get this expression here. Uh, the dark matter has, the, we know the known dark matter density. It has this 10 to the 6 Q factor I mentioned. And then whatever coupling it has is the one that we know the instrument is either excluded or is sensitive to. Whereas on the right-hand side, uh, the CAB has a different energy density and Q factor, but potentially could have a much larger coupling to electromagnetism. Because this axion is not the dark matter. The only limit we have on it are these star emission bounds I told you at the start. So let's be as optimistic as possible and, and maximize that value. Now, this is just if you look at the frequency uh, in a single bin, more accurately, the CAB deposits power over many bins. And when you account for this, you get the following sensitivity to CAB energy density. Uh, there's two factors where you're going to lose, the fact that we know that the CAB energy density must be much smaller than the dark matter density, and the fact that it is a less coherent signal, this is this, this Q factor uh, expression on the right, but where we can win is that these dark matter instruments are getting very far below the star emission bounds. Okay, so this is the scaling I'll take forward in a moment. I appreciate this was a rough estimate, but more careful um, calculations, and our paper confirmed this, this parametric scaling. 
And so what we have here is this, this CAB landscape I introduced earlier on. And what I can do now is take either the existing or proposed sensitivity of dark matter instruments and map that onto this space using that formula I derived on the previous slide. And doing that, I arrive at this result here. And so what you can see in, in the solid curves are existing instruments, ADMX and Haystack, and in the dashed curves are future instruments. And so they, of course, shouldn't be on the same footing because ADMX exists, dark matter radio is maybe 10, 20 years away. Um, uh, but you can see that ultimately, um, uh, anyway, let, let, let me break this down actually in a couple of ways rather than just summarizing it initially. So some points to make is that existing instruments are not cutting into the genuine cosmic relic regime, but future instruments, particularly those operating at low frequencies will. Dark matter radio is cutting into very interesting parameter space here. And there's actually instruments that operate at lower frequencies that I, I claim can be even better. But as advertised at the start, nothing is getting close to the thermal case. You can see that Mad Max, a future instrument, is still orders of magnitude away. Uh, and, and in fact, in some senses, maybe this isn't surprising because all these instruments are operating looking for a wave. And as I said to you, at these you know, um, higher frequencies, actually the CAB is entering this regime where it's individual axions flying around. So maybe it's not surprising that some instrument designed to look for a wave couldn't see it. And so the question then comes up is maybe could we design an instrument, um, a, a better instrument that could actually look for this? Again, optimistically, I think the answer is yes, but that's something I'm still looking to flesh out. Separately, I've only talked about searches through the photon today. There are other searches that people look for axions through. And I think actually some of these could be even more sensitive than what I'm showing here, but that's something else I'm thinking about at the moment. And finally, just something that I think is exciting is that, you know, I've talked only about axions that are produced in the early universe. And the challenge there is the energy densities must be small. And so one question I've been thinking about recently is, is there ways to produce axions in the late universe uh, so that you can get around these delta N effects? bounds and potentially have an observable signal in the near future at these instruments. And I think there are ways you could do this, for example, with dark matter decaying, but actually because this axion has a boson, it turns out this is quite a subtle um, problem and something that we're thinking about carefully. Okay, so yeah, just to, to sum up, the claim is that future instruments, I think absolutely could be sensitive to this, this idea of the cosmic axion background, but there's a lot of aspects to this picture that I think are still uncertain and I'm currently thinking about. Okay, I appreciate I've gone a little bit over time. Apologies for that. Um, but just to summarize, I mean, I think the next 10 to 20 years are an exceptionally exciting one. I mean, both particularly for axions, but more generally for dark matter, because it really could be the era when we uncover what is the dark matter of our universe. But more generally, I think it's interesting to think about how we can take advantage of the enormous experimental progress that is going to be necessary in order to make that statement true. Uh, and this is the direction I've told you about today, where we can use new ideas to take advantage of that, both this idea of interferometry and also looking for unexpected signals in the form of the CAP. Okay, let me leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. You're actually not but almost perfect in time. So. Oh, awesome. I thought I was five minutes over. Yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have other questions? Any questions? Um, I have a couple if you don't mind. <laughs> so um, right, so um, this uh, dark matter into Geometry is uh, super interesting how you can break the degeneracy using this uh, rotation. Uh, maybe it's like a, a question, but like, can we actually use like three detectors instead? And maybe they will somehow provide like extra information about the location and maybe as a consistency check as well. Yeah, good. No, so um, in principle, more detectors only helps, but the fundamental the, the, the point is the degeneracy is already lifted once you have two detectors that are not exactly east-west um, and uh, you allow for daily modulation. So there is no more fundamental degeneracies that you would necessarily break with three detectors, although you would be able to do um, this inference uh, uh, more rapidly if you had that information. Now, th th there is one caveat to that I would say is that, you know, it's a question of how rapidly you can break this, this degeneracy. So, if you're, you're exactly um, east-west, then there is an exact degeneracy with this um, uh, ref, uh, reflection across this plane. But let's say your instruments just happen to be at quite similar 
um, uh, latitudes, uh, then eventually you'll break this degeneracy, but not very quickly. So then a, a third detector would, would help you speed up how quickly you're able to uh, extract that additional information. And also just one point to, to emphasize is that the procedure we, we've put together here, these instruments don't all have to be the same. Uh, we describe in our paper, you know, even if they're very different instruments, as long as they're all measuring the, the axion field, there is a procedure you can have for combining that information. Thanks, thanks. That's really cool. Um, so one other question about um, cosmic axiom background. So uh, and I was wondering if, so like um, you, you said that it's uh, certain models that might provide some mechanism for generating this uh, axiom background. I was wondering if like as an analogy to like cosmic microwave background, which has a really like, thin last scattering surface, which lets us like um, see very clear um, signal with like specific redshift. Do we also expect these models to like decouple about like, the very specific time or otherwise it'll be like over a certain period of time and the spectrum might be a bit blurred somehow? That makes sense. That's a really, yeah. So this is a, um, a very interesting question and one I haven't given sufficient thought. I, I mean, just to say like more generally, if you start to um, uh, resolve a CAB, then I would want to, you know, ultimately you want to start looking if there's structure in it, because of course we know there's eventually structure in that cosmic microwave background. But there are two challenges to this. The first is that the signal is already just essentially, the, the, you know, the monopole is very dim. Um, so just resolving this is very challenging and then looking for structures within this, I mean, as, as you can see in here, uh, you, you have to be very optimistic. But that, I mean, maybe if we detect this, we, we could then build a dedicated instrument for look for that, that's possible. But another question actually that ties into the first part of my talk, we can't see axions into like their direction um, are very easily. We have to use these types of, um, uh, actually, even in the CAB case, we have to use these, we would have to use these types of ideas like interferometry to have any spatial information about this at all. Otherwise, if we're just measuring the time domain, you're just getting essentially a measure of the total energy, not, not really uh, how it's distributed as a location of the sky. And eventually you'd need to measure it quite accurately to start to get the, the, the specific um, uh, maps that um, you know, we have of the CMB. Now, with those caveats aside, if you were able to do all of this, I think in some of these different scenarios, you absolutely would expect um, a different structure. However, I just haven't thought about it in, in an enormous amount of detail. I mean, exactly, you know, for example, you could imagine that there would be some difference on patches of the sky on exactly when the axion decoupled um, uh, from, um, uh, from the standard model, because that will depend on the local temperature, which of course we know that there are fluctuations in that at, at whatever time it was that the axion decoupled. So I would expect some um, uh, fluctuations on this. I mean, then also these axions are relativistic species. They then um, uh, propagate through the universe. They will get uh, lensed. So there will be additional structure in this map, of course. Um, but I just haven't thought about, about this in detail yet. So th there will be that information, but this is an unexplored space. Um, uh, that I, I just need to get, I think, even more optimistic than I am here to think about in a ton of detail. Yeah. But it's an interesting yeah. question. It would be super exciting if we can get to this. <laughs> right, does anyone else have a question? Um, just before we go, like maybe one last, like, of course, as many as you want. Kind of, yeah, yeah more, more about like your intuition. Like, um, how likely do you think it is that we're going to detect axion like in say next 10 years like just your intuition I was curious. yeah i think 10 years is um probably too soon uh i think that these instruments that i we're really i mean maybe the uh i can just quickly go back to the relevant plot here um and, and show you this briefly So I think that, so I'm, uh, I'm showing you, for example, dark matter radio will cover down to about the nano EV scale. Getting right down, that I think the most uh, well-predicted scenarios are maybe down to 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11. Getting down there would be very challenging. I don't necessarily think we'll do that in the next 20 years, but I think in the next 20 years, assuming that, um, and of course, this is, this is a big caveat, yet there's as we build larger versions of these detectors some unanticipated experimental challenge 
um, uh, it sort of blocks the progress that we think is achievable. Of course, with new technologies, that's something you worry about, but there's some very smart people thinking about this, so, and they haven't thought of anything yet, so I'm optimistic that that won't emerge. I actually think that we will largely cover this entire band from about a nano EV all the way up to where it hits these star emission bounds. There are many ideas going around, so we really should cover it. And if this is, um, if the axion is dark matter, then it should live somewhere along this line, it is our best guess. And I mean, for me at the moment, I think, I think that there's, I mean, I'm very optimistic that the axon is what is the, the particle of our universe. And so I think on probably a 20 year time scale, we'll cover this and we absolutely could find it. Um, but I can't, it's, I mean, of course, it's really difficult to put a, uh, you know, a real probabilistic statement on that, because I think what we've learned in some senses from this WIMP story is that, um, of course, we, we knew this at some level, but nature doesn't care how excited we are about any particular theory. It just, of course, the most important thing is that it, it is what it is. And the axon's a very nice story, but I think the WIMP was a very nice story as well. And, and so far, it really hasn't shown up. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we really could find um, um, this axion. I think independent of whether it's dark matter, it's a very interesting particle to search for because it's the best guess we have to solve this separate strong CP problem I mentioned. Um, but I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to tell you it's 100% likely. I mean, internally, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, above 50% because I'm, I'm excited, but certainly less than 100. <laughs> so there's a hedged answer for you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I see a question from Christoph. Yes, so I have a hopefully very simple question. Um, likely a stupid question as well. But uh, assuming that the dark matter in the galaxy is has some kinematics it might be rotating very similar to the speed of our solar system will this make the detection of any dark matter dipoles in with your detector on the earth more difficult or can you actually measure basically the rotation kinematics of the dark matter then yeah oh so this is i mean no no, no this is not a dumb question at all this is really interesting and this is something that people think about a lot and actually, in most models of dark matter, we think we have a reasonable dis understanding of, of, of what it looks like in the Milky Way halo. So essentially, what happens is that um, because the dark matter can't dissipate energy, it's not able to collapse the way that baryons do into a disk. And so it's because of you know, this collapse that um, uh, by conservation of angular momentum, you end up in, in, in this same rotating structure. The, the dark matter won't undergo this. It just essentially remains as a sphere, spherical halo around the disk of the Milky Way. And actually within this, the bulk of the dark matter, we expect to be just flying around like a gas. So actually the, the dark matter, we do not expect to be um, co-rotating um, uh, like the disk, but that's the bulk expectation. Now, what we actually think is that this, this dark matter in the, in the Milky Way halo will have quite a rich structure well beyond this simple picture I just described to you. And actually understanding this is what you could hope to tease out with these types of instruments. So just to give you two examples of this, we know um, that there are streams of, you know, stellar streams around the Milky Way of stars. We also expect there to be long, you know, for example, the Sagittarius stream. We also expect there to be large streams of dark matter going around. Um, and these would be just by Louisville's theorem, because they're spatially extended, they'll have very small velocity um, uh, dispersions. And so this was actually the stream example I mentioned earlier that gave rise to this wild animation. Um, we, we could have that some fraction of the dark matter at the Earth is some stream that could be coming in essentially any direction that we would want to study. Uh, separately, people have thought that there could be some subcomponent of dark matter that is dissipative, so it has some mechanism for um, uh, uh, losing energy, and then it could collapse into a disk. We know not all the dark matter could do this, it would, it would be observable. Um, but uh, if this was the case, then there could be some actual dark disk uh, that is co-rotating exactly in the, in the fashion that you mentioned. And if this was the case, we wouldn't just see the signal prediction that I, I was showing you on, um, uh, for example, this slide here. We wouldn't just see this simple structure here. We would see modifications to this. And if we saw those modifications, we could start to tease this out exactly using this interferometry idea that I mentioned, because this thing gives you the spatial location. We could determine which direction it, it's coming from, and then through its velocity information, map out the full 60 phase space of um, the, the, the dark matter locally. So, but there's a lot of literature on this that if you're interested, send me an email, I'd be happy to share with you. It's a really, really interesting question. Yeah, thank you a lot. Cool. I think that's about time, but does anyone else have a quick question maybe? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker for a great talk today. And, uh,